The Diels-Alder reaction takes place between a diene and a molecule that we call a dienophile. A dienophile, which translates to lover of a diene. The diene has structural re structural requirement. It needs to be in the S cis conformation when it undergoes cis reaction. The dienophile also has some structural requirements as well. First of all, let's talk about this little X thing. On one of the carbon atoms of the dienophile, there needs to be this group that we're calling an X. In this particular situation, the letter X is not being used to represent halogen. It is being used to represent one of these different types of functional groups. You can see most of them are functional groups that have carbon oxygen double bonds, but then we also do have the carbon-nitrogen double bond as well. This little squiggly line is used to indicate this is the point where it attaches to the dienophile. So it could look something like this, like where here's our little squiggly line where it's attaching to the dienophile, or maybe um, we would have like this guy right here to kind of squish that down to make it fit. The dienophile also needs to be either an alkene or an alkyne. I'm showing this reaction here as it would take place with a dienophile that's an alkene. If you have an alkyne, you just end up with an extra double bond in your product over here. And then also um, notice that I've not only have I color coded the diene and the dienophile as they come into the product, but I've also numbered the six carbons that are involved in this reaction to help you keep track of where they go. The um, So as you can see, the reaction forms two carbon-carbon bonds between the diene and the di dienophile, and it always results in the formation of a six-membered ring every single time because the reaction is occurring between a total of six carbons. The only thing that you need to make this reaction work is heat. Sometimes heat is being represented by this little triangle underneath the arrow. That just means the same thing. Let's take a look at a few examples of diels alder reactions. Um, so when I'm doing Diels-Alder reactions, I uh, typically like to begin by numbering my carbon atoms. So I'm going to number the, the four carbon atoms of the diene, and I'm also going to number the carbon atoms of the dienophile. If there are more than six total carbon atoms in our molecules, like this little guy right here, I don't number that. I only number the, the six carbon atoms that are involved in the formation of this six-membered ring. In terms of arrow pushing for the mechanism for the Diels-Alder reaction, all that we're doing is shifting around these three double bonds. That's all that we do. Um, we're going to pick one of these three double bonds to begin with, and we're just going to start moving it either clockwise or counterclockwise. It does not matter which bond you start with, and it also doesn't matter which bond or which direction you move it. My personal preference is that I always start with the bond between carbon number one and two, and I always move all of my bonds clockwise for no particular reason. That's just how I like to do it. So um, actually, and also what I'm going to do before we get further along, I'm going to dot out over here on the product side the six carbon atoms of the diene and the dienophile. I'm also going to number them. And again, these little dots are just being used to represent the carbon atoms. And we're going to fill in the bonds and everything else on those carbon atoms. So like I said, for my mechanism, I like to start with carbons one and two. Um, the, the pi electrons between carbons number one and two, I like to move my electrons clockwise. So I'm going to move those pi electrons down to um, be between carbons two and three. So when I did that, the, the double bond between carbons one and two turned into a single bond. So I'm going to draw that over here. And then the single bond between carbons two and three turned into a double bond. So I'm going to draw that in as well. And then we just continue on with this pattern. So I moved carbons one and two into two and three, and now I'm going to take the electrons between three and four, and I'm going to move that clockwise as well. Those electrons are going to go into this empty space. They're going to be used to create this bond between carbons four and five. So let's go back to our product. What did we do? Between carbons three and four, we took that double bond, we turned it into a single bond, and then between carbons four and five, we have created a new bond right there. And then we're gonna do this one more time. We're gonna take our, our last double bond, the double bond between carbons five and six, and we're gonna move that also up into this empty space. So between carbons five and six, we went from a double bond to a single bond, and then we created this new bond between carbons six and one. Don't forget, we have the aldehyde that's attached to carbon number six, so we've gotta draw that in as well. And uh, since we created a stereo center, this is a chiral carbon right here, we do wanna recognize that there are going to be two enantiomers, uh, the R enantiomer and the S enantiomer. 
in antiomers. Both in antiomers are formed. Let's do another example of this molecule or this reaction down here. Again, I want to start by numbering the six carbon atoms that are actually participating in this diels alder reaction. I'm going to dot those carbon atoms out for my product over here. And I don't always um, take this many steps, but this is, you know, sort of a good way to c approach it when you're just first learning how to do the diels alder reaction. So there's my six carbons. I like to start between carbons one and two and move those electrons clockwise. So that means between carbons one and two, I went from a double bond to a single bond. And between two and three, I went from a single bond to a double bond. Then continue with that pattern. So I'm gonna go to three, four, and I'm gonna move those electrons over here to form a bond between carbons four and five. So three to four went from a double bond to a single bond. And four to five, we created a new bond. And then we're gonna do that one more time. From five to six, move those electrons up into this space. Five to six went from a double bond to a single bond. And six to one is a bond that we created. Now, last but not least, we have these two substituents that we have on carbons six. That is an ester group. And carbon number five, that is a bromine. I do want you to notice that in the original dienophile, the relative position of these two substituents was trans. So this was a trans dienophile. And we do want to represent that in our product over here as well. So we want to show that the um, two substituents on carbons five and six are trans with respect to each other. So I'm just going to add some stereochemistry to these bonds. I'm going to say, let's put the bromine on the dash and we'll put this ester on the wedge. And then of course, we also are going to form the enantiomer of this particular molecule. Last but not least, um, here we have a little bit more complicated looking reaction. Begin again by numbering just the six carbons of the reaction. So I'm not going to be numbering this carbon out here because it's not part of the four carbon diene system. And then also over, over here, let's make some dots to represent those same six carbons and we'll number them so that we can keep track of them. I'm gonna start with carbons one and two and I'm gonna move those electrons clockwise. So one and two is now a single bond, two and three is now a double bond. Go to four and, car, excuse me, carbons three and four, that double bond, just you know, ignore all of this right now because this isn't part of what we're thinking about. Just like these examples up here, the electrons between carbons three and four, they are going into the empty space to create the new bond between four and five. So three to four is now a single bond. Four to five is the bond that we created. And then from five to six into the empty space as well to create this new bond between carbon six and carbon one. So carbon five and six is now a single bond and six and one is the bond that we created. So let's take a look at the uh, substituents. We have the cyanides on carbon five and six, and they are cis to each other. So I'm just gonna straight off the bat represent that um, with wedges. And then we also have the enantiomer where they are both dashes. And then last but not least, let's deal with this little guy right here. So we have this CH2 that is connecting carbons one and four. And we're just going to fit that in just like that. Now you probably, um, or maybe you haven't, there's a prettier way of drawing this particular molecule right here, which I'm just going to draw really quick over on the side like this, like that. And I'll just go ahead and just kind of sketch in my cyanides. I didn't really leave myself a lot of space there. So this is a um, you know, a, a fancier looking representation of this same molecule. Let me number the carbons so that you can kind of see where they ended up. Five, six, with this little point right here being this little carbon of the ring.